Good morning. It is great to hear you all fellowshipping and enjoying each other's company. We come in as the family of faith. We come in at the end of a week, in the beginning of a week, where we recognize that God has been at work in our lives, making things come together for the good. And so we're here ready to praise God. We also recognize that there are things in front of us in the upcoming week, and we have no idea how they will work together for the good. And so we come as children. Welcome to Walt Inch and Presbyterian Church. We do have just a few announcements that we need to make. First, thanks to the Connections Band, who will be leading us in worship this morning. Take note that DCE 200 will take place just after service. It's about a 45-minute long Sunday school class. We'll focus on Lectio Divina today. Also, at 6 p.m., the session will meet. So if you're a part of that group, We'll be in prayer for you this evening. And let's see, we did have a great first terrific Thursday. A group of 20 went down to Huntersville to view the Raptors at the Raptor Center. Great time of fellowship and education. We appreciate all who came out and helped us make that happen with those little kids. And now I'm going to turn it over to Laurie. She has an announcement for us. This morning, right after this worship service, there are seven of our middle schoolers and Wes and Tricia and I who are headed to Montreat for Worship and Music Week. It's the first time we've been able to go since 2019 because of COVID. Um, so I want to ask you to lift us all up in prayer this week. And the girls who are going are Emma, Ruby, Madeline, Marissa, Anna, Lila, and Piper. And most of them are, are in here in the room. Would y'all stand if you're here right now? Lila and Emma have to join us um, there at Montreat. Uh, thank you, girls. We are um, so excited about this week. They will be participating in worship, um, some are dancing, liturgical movement. Some are playing drums in a drumming class. They have two choir rehearsals each day. Um, it's a busy schedule for them. Uh, but a lot of fun things too, a great art class. They're gonna use some old masks that we are donating to create artwork for the worship during the week. Um, also donating new socks to the area um, through the liturgical movement dance and Thursday they're gonna offer, make an offering. So a lot of good, interesting things happening. I'm so thankful to this church for the way you support this group as they go, um, for their parents for allowing them to go and we treasure your prayers this week. I also wanted to let you know there's a yellow insert in your bulletin. We're singing a different doxology today and the Connections Band will sing it once as the offertory. And then I'll, I'll motion for you to stand and as the ushers bring the plates forward, we will sing it using your insert in the bulletin, we'll sing it once through too. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laurie. Now let us prepare our hearts for worship.
You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all day long. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. All the nations you have made shall come and bow down before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. may be seated. In the scripture, the book of James, we read that when we confess our sins to God and to one another, we find healing. And so each week we pray together the prayer of confession. Let's pray together this prayer, making it our own. Oh Lord, we need your help. Come quickly. Deliver us from the world's true problems and our complicity in them. Deliver us from the problem of lying, which is called propaganda. The problem of selfishness, which is called self-interest. The problem of greed, which is called profit. The problem of license, disguising itself as liberty. The problem of lust, masquerading as love, and the problem of materialism, the hook which is baited with security. Forgive us, gracious Lord. We ask all this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The steadfast love of God is with you yesterday today and tomorrow, whether you turn away in doubt 
whether you follow timidly or joyfully, you are loved by our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us go together to God in prayer. Please pray with me. Gracious and abiding Lord, you are the first and the last and the living one. And because you live, we also live. So gather us close in the quiet of this hour. Search us. Know our hearts and our needs. Grant that we might trust you enough to unlock the very corners of our hearts that we enclose and conceal. God of compassion, binder of broken hearts, you have suffered with us in Christ. And we lift up all who wrestle with the loss of loved ones this day. Abide with those who have lost loved ones to immoderate weather, to unanticipated disaster, to the vagaries of human life and relationship. Abide with those still digging out from the earthquake in Afghanistan. Touch those who face the loss in the days ahead, lost jobs, lost homes, lost hopes. Hear our prayers. God of mercy, Lord of wholeness, you carry us as a mother carries a child. We lift before you all who struggle against the specter of illness and injury. Shepherd those who are healers and caregivers. And this day grant that those who are ill and wounded would find your true healing. Hear our prayer. Gracious God and Father of us all, we are thankful for faithful parents. Grant them wisdom, energy, strength, enthusiasm. Grant that children would be nurtured by their love and in those places where their are our abusive parents protect the children. Deliver them from those who afflict. Hear our prayer. God of strength, Lord of redemption, you support us all the day long until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed. 
be with those who suffer affliction and circumstances for which there is no cure. Uphold those in need of the energy and faith to journey from day to day. Help those who are afflicted and their caregivers to know that you are never far away and hold them fast in your firm right hand. Transform those situations beyond all control with your strength to endure. Hear our prayer. God of redemption, Lord of the second chance, render your mercy and understanding in those places of human conflict. Create new possibilities for forgiveness, especially this day we lift up the Ukraine and her people. We pray that you would spare further violence, that you would bring those who dispute to the bargaining table, that you would stand beside those who live in broken homes and broken relationships, that you would protect the innocent and remind those who afflict that they too will stand before your judgment seat. We are thankful for those who dream that one day all would sit together at the table of brotherhood and sisterhood. Foster the dream rather than fester the wounds. Let unity overcome estrangement, forgiveness heal guilt, and love conquer despair. Hear our prayer. God of wisdom giver of sight to the blind, guide and direct us all in places of confusion. Guide and direct all who endeavor to lead others. Transform leaders that they might offer, author peace, justice, and equity. Protect all from the abuse of power and imprudent policy. And be with people who search for solutions to quandaries of conscience and decision. Hear our prayer. Lord of the church, abide with your servants around the globe. Protect, shepherd, and grant fruitfulness. Help your church to always be the church, fearless in proclaiming the gospel, steadfast in displaying your love, relentless in advocating your justice and mercy. Direct our officers in the faithful discharge of your call. Guide and protect this congregation. Make us faithful witnesses until all surround your table in glory gathered in Christ in whose name we utter our prayer and lodge our hope. Remembering that he taught us to pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Let us pray together. Gracious and merciful Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. The um, text today from 2 Kings is one of those strange texts in ways. I don't uh, quite know how to, how to handle that. It is uh, one that if you'll just insert yourself in the story a little bit and contemplate what's going on, I, I think there are some interesting images. Hear the word of the Lord. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. So, but Elijah, Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, <clears throat> I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I'm being, take, being taken from you, it will be granted to you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father! the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But he could no longer see him. He grasped his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. He picked up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord? God of Elijah, when he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. Friends, grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Kind of a curious text, isn't it? Kind of a, kind of a big ending for the prophet Elijah. Elijah, the only one who stood up to the 600 priests of Baal when Ahab and Jezebel were afoot. The only one who stood up and said, 
you know, look at this. Look at this. I alone, he would say, I alone am left among all the prophets of the Lord Most High. And he does battle with them. And as the Bible tells it, 600 pieces of uh, Baal bite the dust. I doubt they went into that old song, boom, 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 and another one bites the dust. But, and please don't tell anybody I sung that. In there. <laughs> but, it, but in that, what, what in the world kind of tale is this? Does it strike you as odd? I, I try to imagine when they get to Bethel, I try to imagine when they're in Jericho and these prophets come out and join them. What do they look like? I always imagine prophets in that day and time are kind of strange, wild-looking creatures. I see them kind of shuffling along in their, their tunics and following. I wonder if they kind of look like the minions and the, uh, they have, you know, although they have two eyes and everything like that. But I wonder, what does this look like? This strange parade ultimately headed for the Jordan River with this prophet who is the epitome of what a prophet of the Most High looks like, Elijah himself. And Elisha, whose own heritage will be pretty significant as well. And I start wondering, what, what are we supposed to do with this kind of text as the people of God? It seems to me there are several storylines that are running parallel in this. Part of it is very, very human part of the story. The, the saying goodbye when you know it's going to be a, a significant goodbye, when you know it's going to be a parting of some import for the remainder of your whole life journey. I also think there is something in it that was a word to the early church, the early church that was still trying to live into its sense of what Jesus saying, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And yet there is something for us too, isn't there? There's something for us in times of transition in life, in times where we're trying to live into our skin in a new place like this congregation is doing as it moves toward the work of the PNC being uh, culminated as it moves toward a new e epoch in its own life. What's going on? There was uh, kind of a scandal at one time in the Presbyterian Church. One of our uh, pastors who pastored one of the largest churches in the denomination, they were always on TV and all that kind of stuff, and, you know, he really felt like he needed to knock a home run every Sunday. I mean, they're just not going to keep watching. They're not going to mail in checks at the end of the day unless it's a really good sermon. And so he hired, I say that rather than called very intentionally, a professor of preaching from one of the seminaries. And when this person who was just looking forward to being on a church staff, real life, real church, not just on a, an institutional staff, got there, found out the, uh, the job was that he write the sermons for the head of staff every Sunday, that they would be there, and he would have these carefully crafted uh, sermons, these carefully shaped series that would take place and for quite a while the assistant did that and produced those sermons until one day until one day when the pastor stepped into the pulpit and he was preaching on the book of Habakkuk I know y'all were just reading that just the other day right 
And he gets there and he builds up to a crescendo. And he says, and now the central message of the key text in Habakkuk, the only selection that finds its way into the common lectionary once every three years is, and he turned the page and all the assistant had written there was, your own, your own now, buddy. I don't know, y'all feel kind of like that in a transitional period? I think one of the things that is, is very intriguing to me about this text is this time of year when it shows up, there are a lot of recent graduates who are out there who have, um, are kind of facing that in some ways for the first time. You're on your own now. You got to figure this thing out this real life, real jobs, making real headway in the world and hopefully leaving your mark, making a, making a statement about it, what it means and what is, it means to be fruitful in ways that help change things for the better. I think part of the human story that is in this text is about a time of transition like that and if I go back to some of those times in life you know there, there's sometimes you just know the story's going to be different going forward I know something that that for both Celia and myself has been an important transition at times in life my son had taken a job in China teaching English as a second language I told him how when he didn't really have a second language, how he could talk about English as one. But that being said, I knew at the airport that day I was not going to see him at best for a year and a half. I know Celia was sending sons off into the Navy one time. One was going to Okinawa, and it was going to be a year before she saw him. You know, when you have that moment when you're together and it is getting ready to change and they, yeah, you're going to Skype or Zoom now, stuff like that, but it's not the same, is it? And you know when you hug their neck, it's going to be the last one of those you're going to get for a while. I still remember standing in the airport in Charleston, South Carolina. We had gone to the beach for the week before John's departure. And as we gathered in that airport, I think about the people who felt more like interlopers than I think I'd ever felt in my life who were watching us crying and hugging and saying goodbye. And it felt invasive. I wonder if that day for Elisha and Elijah, if those prophets who were following them around felt that way, infringing on their private moment as these two prophets who were not just prophets, they were dear friends and comrades in the faith. What does it mean to have that kind of moment in just a very real and human way? It's the same thing the disciples are going through with Jesus, isn't it? If we look at those texts like the ones at the end of the Gospel of John, you know the way to the place where I am going and the disciples, God bless them, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. They're wrestling with that. What is it going to mean to say goodbye to Jesus, who says he's coming back for us, but to say goodbye for a season, when you know it's a significant period of time? What's it going to mean for these two prophets who know it's going to be a significant period? interlude in
in their own life and relationship. For Elisha, he is struggling with it. And he shows us in the text he's struggling because what does he do? He tears his robe. He rends it in two. Tears his own mantle. So we see what it's like for them personally. We see what it's like for the church. We can imagine what it is like for the company of prophets, even though we don't even know who these folks are who were in the company of prophets at that time. They are just a nameless, faceless bunch. But you know what? They're the ones who are there now. They're the ones who are there in the trenches now, advocating the cause of God, proclaiming, what God would have the people of God do and be in the world. And so we know it's that kind of moment. But we also know what's going on. We also know that there is a mantle being passed, and it is a significant mantle. Elijah was the one. When there was only one prophet left, Elijah, who went to the mountains, and you remember that great passage when he's at the mountains, when the the earth shakes, when the wind roars, when there is this terrific storm and everything, and he is waiting for God to pass by. And he waits, and he waits, and there is quite a display going on, a cosmic display. And then when it is over... What the Hebrew says, it was silent silence. It's double silent. It's still. It's quiet. King James Version says, Then this still small voice, Elijah, what are you still doing there? See, that's the nature of God in those places where the noise settles down, in those places of transition, in those places where we're called as the people of God to do what Elisha does after Elijah has managed to whack the water and it parts in the Jordan as much as it can part in a place like that, just like Moses parting the Red Sea. And he's got his answer to his request. I want a double share of whatever kind of spirit the Lord God has given you, Elijah. Last man standing. One that whacked all of the priests of Baal and returned God's people to God. A double share. Lo and behold, he's got. And what does he do? He has picked up the mantle. He is making his way as a prophet going forward in the absence of Elijah with the same kind of oomph that Elijah had in the faith that God has thus endowed him. He had the audacity to say, God, give me a double portion because we got big stuff to do. I think that's God's word to Waldensian Presbyterian Church in this era of its life. As you've got a PNC out there looking for your next pastor. As we are in Burke County in western North Carolina, which is an absolutely great place to live, is it not? A place to do ministry a place to make a difference in a new day and a new time and with new fresh challenges, we ought to all be praying, pour out a double portion of spirit on this church that God's will would be done here and in this place for the glory of God. We can kind of handle being on our own in that, can't we? If God will do that in us and with us and through us for the glory of God. Amen.
brothers and sisters, let us stand and say what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed and in doing so give answer to the great question. Christians, what do you believe concerning God? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let us worship God with God's tithe and with our offering. Let us pray together. O oh Lord, our God, all that we have is a good gift of your hand. You open your hands and pour out blessings upon us beyond our imagination. We ask this day that you would devote these gifts to your glory, to your honor, that you would endow us with wisdom, discretion, and knowledge to use them in the ways you intend. These things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. 